welcome to The Edge, where we'll take an in-depth analysis of today's top stories by looking beyond the edge. We'll bring you not just the facts, but also deep insights into the topics with expert opinions and social media reactions. Let's make a start with our look beyond the edge. Iran has reached an agreement with the International Atomic Energy to allow the agency the continued access to some of Iran's key nuclear sites. The agreement could potentially be a small step towards reconciliation with the rest, as Iran is already facing mounting pressure from the coronavirus and a struggling economy. Is the Iranian president willing to ease relations with the West by complying with this deal? Israeli warplanes launched airstrikes on the Gaza Strip earlier on Monday with tensions between Israel and Palestine already raised due to ongoing difficulty in reaching a long-term ceasefire following the war in May because of the Palestinian prisoners who escaped a high-security prison last week but were later arrested. Can international efforts be successful to broker an agreement? Turkey and Greece have been key transit points for migrants aiming to cross into Europe, fleeing war and persecution to start new lives. Greek Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis says that Greece and Turkey are on the same page to prevent human traffickers from smuggling irregular migrants. How can both countries work together to end the plight of migrants? Uh, these are the top three stories that we'll be taking a look at today from Beyond the Edge. Let's get started. Despite the string of attacks that Iran has faced in the recent past, the country's nuclear program has a long history. Our infographic explains. The International Atomic Energy Agency said on Monday that Iran's government made no promises to the UN atomic watchdog following the last-minute deal on nuclear monitoring. The International Atomic Energy Agency Director General Rafael Grossi said on Monday, hours after returning from Tehran, that Iran's new government made no promises to the UN atomic watchdog, but Tehran understands that open nuclear issues needed to be addressed. Uh, I did not get any promises. One thing I got is the agreement that this uh, is something that needs to be done. And this is why I hope to be very soon in Tehran to uh, have this type of uh, conversation, which is, which is badly needed. Adding that Iran's new head of its atomic energy organization, Mohammed Eslami, would visit the IAEA in Vienna next week, and the director general expressed hope to return to Iran very soon for a conversation which is badly needed. I need to have a clear conversation with the new government about this, precisely to a certain extent to what um, you are mentioning, the fact that we have been trying in different ways to have a more focalized effort, having 
um, a compartmentalized um, analysis of each one of the situations. And for the time being, we have not received the kind of uh, feedback. The International Atomic Energy Agency reached an agreement with Iran on Sunday to solve the most urgent issue between them, the overdue servicing of monitoring equipment to keep it running, raising hopes of fresh talks on a wider deal with the West. Grossi obtained the agreement in a last-minute trip to Tehran he called constructive before a meeting of his agency's 35-nation Board of Governors this week at which Western powers were threatening to seek a resolution, criticising Iran for a stonewalling the IAEA. A resolution risked an escalation with Tehran that could kill the prospect of resuming wider indirect talks between Iran and the United States on reviving the 2015 Iran nuclear deal aimed at keeping Iran at arm's length from being able to develop a nuclear weapon if it chose to. And to discuss this, I'm joined live from Milan in Italy by Arash Azizi, who's an Iranian writer and historian at New York University. Arash, thank you for joining us again here today on The Edge. What are the latest developments regarding the negotiations between Iran and the other members of the JCPOA? Well, uh, because of the agreement reached yesterday between Rafael Grossi and Iran, uh, as uh, as outlined in a joint statement of IAEA and Iran, the Western countries, that is the United States, Britain, France, and Germany, agreed uh, not to push a resolution condemning Iran in today's meeting of the Board of Governors of IAEA in Vienna. Had they done that, had they pushed the resolution, Iran could have been referred to the United Nations Security Council, as, as was done last year and has been done several times in the last, uh, you know, decade and a half that the nuclear crisis has been going on and it would have been a uh, you know it, it would have been a grave situation so the the agreement yesterday uh, you know it seems to Iran Iran seems to have played its cards well because it did very little it considered very little um, it basically just considered to restoration of memory cards that had been off for uh, for two weeks um, without giving actual access to the content of the memory cards so the agency can't look at anything that's gone in Iran since February 24 um, so it considered very little but it got a deal so that the Western countries did not push a, um, a, a resolution in the Board of Governors meeting. I should also say that Iran's new foreign minister of the new hardliner government, Hossein Amir Abdullahian, had his first phone call today with his British counterpart, where he uh, promised, well, he didn't actually promise, but he, he showed a willingness to continue the talks, um, uh, you know, about the JCPOA. And he, he basically said that if the talks achieve results, uh, Tehran would like to continue them. Well, obviously, this is um, something that uh, is very important to, to Iran. They don't want to just be carrying, uh, holding talks for the sake of holding talks. They want to see process, uh, progress as well. Can, can you just explain to me what was the potential minefield that we're about to step in over the weekend? I think this goes back to a law that was passed at the end of last year and, and then a, a similar situation that happened in February this year with regard to the security cameras. Can you explain to us what is the background there? Well, uh, look, there's a couple of points. First of all, let me uh, start with the issue that Iran has not addressed at all. And Grossi today in his press conference made clear that Iran had made no promise on that. That is the issue of, uh, basically, in 2018, traces of uranium were found in an undeclared site, in a carpet cleaning facility that Israelis have actually warned about before. But uh, at any rate, in a carpet cleaning facility in Tehran, traces of uranium were found. Iran does not explain, nor does it uh, sort of promise to later explain or investigate or declare, or basically uh, give any justification as to why, you know, what, what were these traces of uranium, which are obviously related to nuclear activities, doing in this uh, carpet cleaning facility. So an undeclared a nuclear site exists, um, and, and, and more than one, actually, and that really worries the agency. So Iran promises no. Um, uh, you know, promises no collaboration on that, and that's that's one problem. The other problem is that, of course, Iran, following Donald Trump's withdrawal from the JCPOA, the, the Iran nuclear deal of 2015, Trump in in 2018 withdraw. Iran has been basically violating uh, that agreement on its own side. Uh, it has increased its nuclear activities way beyond what is allowed in the JCPOA. Now, when Biden came to power. Uh, in, in, in early this year, in 2021, he has basically followed the policy of wanting to return to JCPOA. And Rouhani administration uh, was very 
clear that this is what it wants uh, also. So it seemed for a while that two sides wanted the same thing, to go back to the JCPOA. After all, uh, on both sides, you had people who had negotiated a deal in the first place, i.e. Biden's government, which is mostly Obama-era diplomats, mm -hmm. and, and Iran's government. But we've had a change since then as well. Um, Iran has had a election, which wasn't much of an election because results were known beforehand. But at any rate, Iran has had a change in orientation, and it, it doesn't seem to want only a return to the JCPOA. So the agreement reached in February was a very temporary agreement in which IAEA basically said, OK, we can't monitor. You're basically not letting us monitor. Let us put some cameras there. We look at the images later, right? But it was a three months agreement and it was supposed to be an interim agreement. Now it's been going on for a very long time, and from February 24th till now. And the more it goes, uh, the more untenable become, uh, it becomes. Um, and the Sunday agreement was just that because the memory card in these cameras had been full basically for about two weeks. And, and all Iran agreed to yesterday was that they would, the IAEA inspectors would be allowed to replace the memory cards, right? Uh, so that the recording could go. But I still uh, can't view them. So to, in, a, in a nutshell, the crisis is that Iran uh, has not continued negotiations to return to JCPOA since June. It has stopped negotiating since June. Um, and the, uh, the Western side is very much keen on bringing Iran uh, back to the negotiating table, especially now, especially because the window of Iran reaching enough and reach the uranium for a bomb has, according to expert David Albright, uh, been reduced to one month now only, whereas the JCPOA was supposed to keep it at 12 months. So obviously this is, uh, this is a major concern. Uh, uh, Grossi, in, in his discussion, uh, in his press conference, said that they would be resuming talks sometime soon. Now, also on the Iranian side, it must be um, uh, while they are able to um, apparently continue enriching uranium at this, uh, at this moment because of the, the checks and balances aren't being uh, properly scrutinized. Um, also, they have sanctions against them, so, th so they must want to come back to the table fairly soon. Why do you think it's still being stalled? Well, uh, it's a very good question, and it's a very good, uh, you know, we have to see what calculations the Raisi administration and Ayatollah Khamenei, Supreme Leader, who is the one who calls the shot, ultimately will have. Um, you know, from their side, you know, the yes, sanctions have destroyed Iran, as we know it really. They have destroyed the Iranian economy. Um, but at the same time, the, uh, for Khamenei and for the rulers of the Iranian regime, they've been able to keep in power and they've been able, they've learned after so many years how to weather uh, the pressure, the sanctions. They've learned from countries like Venezuela. They've learned to expand their relations with country like, countries like Russia and China, who, by the way, it was Russia who organized Grossi's meeting to Iran on Sunday, and Russia and China not going along with the three Western allies and the United Nations Security Council also really affects things. Um, so, you know, there are many reasons for them, you know, to want to stall, uh, basically, to, because they can they can avoid giving any concessions and they can be in this nuclear threshold state, which means they can, um, you know, uh, which means they can have, they can be in the situation where they follow, they continue the negotiations without actually conceding on the program. Um, but ultimately, it's the question of you know what decisions they'll they'll make and whether they'll and they'll accept to basically heavily dismantle. At this point, um, if they want to return to JCPOA, they will need to dismantle a lot, right? They will need to dismantle a lot of nuclear activities in pro in exchange with a, some sort of a return um, to international community. Um, the problem with, with the hardliner government in Iran is that it's not just the nuclear issue that keeps it out. So it, if it agrees on this, there are other reasons, human rights violations, the ballistic missile program, its supports for terrorist groups in the region, um, the fact that it does not pass uh, the necessary legislation that could get it off the blacklist of Financial Action Task Force, FATF, um, in France, which is an anti-money anti laundering scheme uh, that Iran is on its blacklist because it refuses to pass basic sort of anti-terrorist uh, financial legislation. So, you know, its problems, do, its problems don't end there. But ultimately, this is about top decisions taken by Khamenei, by IRGC, by Supreme National Security Council, um, by basically the clerical and military establishment that called the shots in Iran as to what they like the relationship 
with the West to be? Do they want to go in the direction of, of North Korea, um, you know, on a sort of hostility and confrontation with the West and possibly actually achieving, uh, you know, getting to a nuclear weapon? Or do they want to uh, sort of uh, follow a different path and, and scale back? But it's, uh, you know, it's them who, and, and I should say that Amir Abdullahian in his talk with Dominic Raab today said that he acknowledged that there were internal consultation in his government, in Raisi's government, about the future of Iran's participation in nuclear talks and what they'll do. So they're thinking about it, basically, and they're they're deciding on, on an issue that would be very important and affects the lives of millions of Iranians, although, unfortunately, the people who get to make the decisions are not elected by Iranians and and uh, are not accountable to them in any shape or form. Right. Uh, it is arguable that in the year after Donald Trump withdrew from the JCPOA that Iran held the moral high ground as it didn't um, in, initially step outside the bounds of the, of the treaty. But then um, with the U.S. imposing new sanctions, I Iran clamped down and said, we won't, uh, we'll, we'll just do what we want until those sanctions are lifted. And then now um, with Israel putting pressure on and um, uh, again, Iran suggesting that, uh, that Israel have committed terrorist attacks against uh, these facilities, uh, as, they as they would describe it, where does that see things going forward? This is becoming more and more precarious as each day goes forward with the JCPOA unresolved. Number one, in the year after Donald Trump withdrew, Iran also killed hundreds of its own citizens who were who were protesting. There's no moral high ground to the to such a to such a regime that kills um, hundreds of innocent people protesting, and and no moral high ground to a regime that squanders the resources of Iranian people are a pointless, fruitless, a stupid confrontation with the world over a nuclear program that Iranians don't need. We have a country rich in in so many resources, and to pursue a, a, a this this nuclear program that has cost so much, that has really destroyed Iran as we knew it, um, has always you know will always be recounted in the history of Iran not as a sort of a national project that uh, you know that was you know that one could be proud of, but as as really a folly and as part of a scheme to keep power for a small military clerical caste. Uh, you know, not the, uh, the development needs of Iran. So I don't agree uh, on the issue of, okay. of, of moral. Uh, but sorry, you were saying? No, no, no. Okay. Uh, 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 I said that. <laughs> but just very briefly yeah. on the other point. Okay, so on, on on Israel, as you said, I'll just I'll just point out the fact that Grossi said that the IAEA inspectors had been able to inspect the site in Karaj, which had been attacked very clearly by Mossad and the Israelis, and that they have uh, Grossi basically spoke sort of angrily, uh, not necessarily angrily, but he certainly criticized that because he said that actually IAEA's monitoring devices had been one of the four cameras that they had at the Karaj site had been destroyed by the Israelis uh, who who did the attack. Um, but I mean, from the perspective of Israel, the Iranian regime is a regime that denies the Holocaust, that promises to destroy the state of Israel. It says very, you know, it says in very words every day, Iranian leaders say that they want to kill everybody in, in Haifa and Tel Aviv. Right? They, they don't leave it any vague. They say they want to turn these places to dust. And this is a regime that also pursues a nuclear program. So clearly, no matter who's in power in Israel, um, they have a, um, you know, they, they have to deal with this fact that there's a country in the region which has, which threatens to, to destroy them and, and has a nuclear program. And this, um, explains, no, uh, and this explains, of course, why this is such a hot topic. Arash, I'm sorry, I have to cut you there. We've run out of time. Thank you so much for joining us today and giving us uh, your excellent perspective. Thank you. Thank you. When Raisi came to power, he strongly reiterated that he would stick to the nuclear deal and make it one of his priorities. The latest step seems that relations with the West are easing. Coming weeks will show if the tasks will continue in a comprehensive way or not. For now, let's move on to our next topic, speaking about the continuing tensions between Israel and Palestine. Since the 1970s, discussions have been held to find a solution to the never-ending Palestinian-Israeli tensions. What proposals have been brought forward? Our following infographic explains.
Israeli warplanes attacked Rafah, Khan Yunus and Beit Lahir in southern Gaza early on Monday as tensions rose between Israel and Hamas over the Palestinian prisoners who escaped from a high security prison last week. Israeli warplanes carried out airstrikes on three separate areas in the blockaded Gaza Strip on Monday. Israel attacked Rafah, Khan Yunis and Beit Lahia in the southern area of the Strip. Tensions have worsened by the ongoing difficulties in reaching a long-term ceasefire between Israel and Hamas following the Israeli offensive in May. Hamas has demanded that Israel lift a painful economic blockade on Gaza. Israel is yet to take action regarding the blockade. The Israeli government has called upon Hamas to release two Israeli civilians and return the remains of two dead Israeli soldiers in its holding. Tensions between Israel and the Palestinians has also risen over the past days after six Palestinian prisoners escaped from a maximum security jail last week. Israeli forces have since captured four of the inmates. And I joined live from Istanbul in Turkey by Hassan Ben Imran, who's a board member for, uh, of Law for Palestine. Hassan, thank you for joining us again here today on The Edge. Thank you, Andy. We've been hearing of um, more airstrikes on Gaza from uh, Israeli uh, forces. What can you tell us about the, the situation over the weekend? Yeah. So, uh, as we can see and as we saw from the news, uh, Israel seems to be using Gaza as a training field for its soldiers and its new weapons. Uh, they would like to try something else. They would just come up with a new excuse and try to train its soldiers and try the new weapons over the civilians in Gaza. And then this, they say that we just bombed some military sites Palestinian, I mean, the, the militant Palestinian factions' uh, sites in Gaza. And then a few days later or a few hours later, you find out that it was kids and children who, who were killed in these airstrikes. Thankfully, this time, there were no casualties on the Palestinian side. But the fact that Israel can or believes that it can bomb Gaza whenever it wants without any accountability is quite concerning and worrying. Uh, now there are no casualties, but we can't assure that tomorrow there won't be any casualties. And the day after tomorrow there won't be any kids killed and any children killed in these airstrikes. Now, obviously, airstrikes um, are, are the things that can be seen around the world. We, we, we know about them. So the, the, the Israel must have some uh, justification for this. What, what are their claims? Israel has claimed that there, there have been some... Uh, weapons, uh, some some rockets fired from Gaza. Uh, only Israeli sources have said have mentioned that. No international sources have, uh, uh, you know, mm -hmm. confirmed the, the the accuracy of this claim. Uh, Israel has not clarified where these rockets were fired and into where they were fired. And then, in retaliation, as they claim, they started firing uh, or like uh, striking certain sites in Gaza. Uh, but I think it's important to look at the bigger context uh, right here yes. than this particular incident. Uh, Israel is occupying Gaza. It is true that there are no Israeli forces in Gaza right now, the same way as it is in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. But in, it's quite there is a consensus in the international legal community that Israel is the occupying power in Gaza. The population registry is uh, in Gaza is in the hand of Israel. The borders are in the hand of Israel. The aerial, uh, the the the, air, uh, the area, the atmosphere of Gaza basically is in under the control of Israel. The sea uh, borders of Gaza are controlled by Israel. So basically, Gaza is under occupation of Israel. And inter in international law, it's quite clear that an occupying power cannot wage war or cannot go like commit an aggression against. An occupied people. Basically, Israel is responsible for the well-being of these people. Uh, in, in fact, the, they, the they, have a, they have a duty to care, uh, of care for them. Exactly, exactly. Israel is under the duty to, to not just restrain and refrain from killing them, but to provide for them as the occupying power. 
like in the case of the pandemic, Israel was supposed to provide the vaccines for the people in Gaza, not based on its own goodwill, but based on its own legal obligations under international law. Uh, yet Israel does not. Uh, I wish it was just that Israel is not providing or meeting its responsibilities. It's even taken many steps forward to bomb these people to to just whenever there is any justification, whenever there is any pretext, they would go bomb Gaza. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I, 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 it's quite difficult to understand that these rockets were the reason why the, the airstrikes are taking place right now. Israeli government feels a little bit humiliated after what happened lately. The six prisoners who ran, uh, who, the, the, the prison break, the, the famous yes, story that we heard about uh, in the past week. So they're trying to divert the attention again and again. This is subject to debate and discussion, but it's quite difficult to, to believe the Israeli narrative, considering the long uh, track in history of them coming up with pretexts and justifications just basically to continue their own bigger plan of making the lives of people in Gaza harder and harder. In fact, last week on The Edge, uh, we sp um, spoke with a lawyer who explained to us the, the legal situation of, um, of the prisons and how prisoners should be cared for in, um, in, uh, that are being held by Israelis in the Palestinian territories or, uh, or elsewhere. Um, in fact, the number of prisoners that are, that are held is just astonishing. I have some statistics here. Uh, some 4,650 Palestinians, including 200 children, 40 women, and 520 administrative detainees, which I believe mean that the administrative detainees are held without charge. Uh, how, yeah. how can this be possible? Uh, also, again, there is another consensus in international legal community that administrative detention is a breach to international law. It is a violation of international law. Uh, there is no such thing as an administrative detention. Israel came up with this context, with this concept, just to justify keeping, like, holding some people in jail, keeping them in its own prisons without any proof or evidence that they have some, did something wrong. And even the concept of wrong in the eyes of Israeli courts is different than the concept of wrong in the eyes of international law. But uh, let's say that Israeli legal regime is, is, is well justified and is capable of achieving justice. These people are held without any uh, proof that they have committed anything, simply because they are uncomfortable about their own existence, their own activities, their own influence on the Palestinian uh, intellectual uh, circles. They would keep them in jail under the justification of administrative detention or under the title of administrative detention. Uh, there have been so many reports by very well-known uh, international, uh, by very credible international legal bodies about in administrative detention. The, it has been condemned. Israel has been demanded so many times to seize its policy of administrative detention. Yet, uh, again, we come to the same point that Israel uh, finds no reason to respect international law. Simply, it can uh, get away with it every single time. So Israel does not see the need to, to respect and to or to, to respond to these uh, demands. Uh, other Palestinian prisoners are also deprived of their own rights, according to uh, international law that Israel is subject to. Mm -hmm. uh, Palestinian detainees, as they call them, or Palestinian prisoners, many of them, they are called prisoners of war. And prisoners of war are entitled to certain rights in international law. Yet these prisoners are uh, detained as security detainees as uh, uh, criminals sometimes without uh, providing any legal justification for that. Um, by legal justification, I mean a justification that is acceptable by, the, by international law. Uh, Israeli legal regime seems to be operating uh, in its own realm, in its own uh, areas, quite disconnected from uh, the way the international legal regime is, is shaped and is made. Uh, unfortunately, it all comes, down, uh, comes to the point that uh, there is no accountability for Israel. Israel believes it can do w whatever it wishes to, and so it keeps doing whatever it pleases to. Uh, this is a very dangerous uh, thing, and this has to stop, well, as we all believe. How is another question? Well, we can see how dangerous it is because the, 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 uh, the people um, that are, we can say, trapped inside, uh, inside Gaza, 
uh, because they, they can't get out. Uh, the, the people who are trapped there um, obviously feel the tensions, feel the injustices of, of, of life. Um, so it's understandable that they should want to hit out and uh, um, maybe say, send fire kites or, or whatever. But so we, we've got the um, people being held under detention with, outside of international law. We've got, um, we've got the blockade on Gaza. Um, so even after the, the airstrikes, um, the, the, the strip can't be uh, renovated. We've got food and medicine not able to come in. We've got children being held, uh, being tried in military courts. And, and yet, and Israel sending, you mentioned earlier, new weaponry to, to attack these people. How is it that the, the international community hasn't done anything to stop this? And what must they do? Uh, to, to sum it up, Andy, uh, the story of Israel and international law uh, is a story of violation, is a story of disrespect, is a story of uh, zero care given to international law. Uh, as for why the international community has not done much when it comes to holding Israel accountable, it all comes back to the political calculations. But Israel has a strong alliance, international uh, alliance. Here we are obviously talki talking about its strong ties with the United States of America. Uh, simply any United Nations Security Council resolution when it comes to Israel is vetoed by the United States. Whenever it comes to the question of holding Israel accountable or providing even peacekeeping missions, uh, United Nations peacekeeping missions in Palestine, the United States would use it, its veto power to block anything like this. Uh, Israel is more uh, well established in the international systems than the Palestinian are. So basically, Israel believes it's the strongest side, stronger side right here. So the international community is kind of confused between its moral duty to interfere in, in favor of the victims or to maintain their own economic, political ties with the stronger side, which is, in this case, Israel and its allies. Uh, unfortunately, we can see that it is a very shameful sto story in the Absolutely. history of international law Absolutely. and the international community. And, and if the international community is going to keep its humanity and... Um, uh, and stand up for the, its moral duty, then it, it must take action immediately. Hassan Ben Imran, thank you so much for joining us here today on The Edge. Now, Hamas has demanded an end to the economic blockade by Israel. While well, Israel wants Hamas to free two Israeli civilians and return the remains of two dead Israeli soldiers it's holding, Palestinian people bear the brunt of these tensions. Coming days will show if the Israeli aggression towards Palestine continues. But for now, let's move on to our final topic to speak about the global problem of irregular migration. Turkey has been fielding a comprehensive and active fight against irregular migration, for which it's a key route due to its position between Asia, Europe and Africa. Our following infographic has more about the situation. Greek Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis said on Sunday that Turkey and Greece are on the same page on the issue of irregular migration. 
Greece's Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis has vowed to break and smash human traffickers who smuggle irregular migrants across the border from Turkey, as he said Ankara is on the same page regarding the matter. Mitsotakis, in a news conference on Sunday, following his Saturday keynote speech at the Thessaloniki International Fair, also said that he did not anticipate a new wave of irregular migrants from Afghanistan. Turkey and Greece have been key transit points for migrants aiming to cross into Europe, fleeing war and persecution to start new lives. Turkey has also accused Greece of large-scale pushbacks and summary deportations, without migrants being given access to asylum procedures, which is a violation of international law. It also accuses the EU of turning a blind eye to this blatant abuse of human rights. Most recently, Amnesty International criticized Greek authorities for the torture, ill-treatment and illegal pushback of migrants and refugees to Turkey, saying that the country's practice had become its de facto border policy. And discuss this issue and join live from Istanbul in Turkey by Onur Erim, who is a political analyst and president of Dragoman Strategies. Onur, thank you for joining us here again today on The Edge. Irregular migration is, is a topic that, um, uh, that has affected Turkey greatly, with um, coast, currently hosting about 4 million refugees, but also uh, affecting other European countries um, uh, around the world uh, and, uh, and others. The announcement at the weekend that Turkey and Greece are in agreement about something is, is very good news. They're on the same page, they say, um, Mr. Tarkis says, about uh, irregular migration. What is the importance of this statement? It is extremely important uh, from many perspectives, not just from uh, the EU stand, but also uh, Greece's uh, position, and most importantly, because we are the, uh, the most forefront for the EU, uh, for Turkey as well. Uh, my only wish is that uh, Greece, uh, exactly the way, the, the exactly opposite as to what they have been doing so far, uh, would live up to their part of the bargain. Um, illegal migration around the world, uh, with uh, the communication being so much faster, easier and cheaper, with the means of transportation becoming more readily available, and with the gap that has been widening between the developed and the undeveloped nation has been a, an increasing problem for the entire world. So if the, unless the EU, including Greece, realizes that, first of all, uh, if this is an EU issue on their part, that the EU's border start where Turkey's border uh, ends, and that this is a problem that has to be uh, very, taken very seriously and treated at the source, not at the end. Trying to block these people uh, illegally uh, in an inhumane way, like the Greece has been doing for quite some time now, making this an almost state policy, uh, is not the way to resolve this. There has to be more uh, interactive, more, um, you know, to the point and progressive uh, policies that actually prevent this <clears throat> at the source of where these people are coming from and exactly why they are leaving their homeland. Mm -hmm. So um, it is a very uh, promising statement. Uh, my only wish is that uh, Greece, but actually more importantly, EU, uh, stands beyond this, behind this statement and does what this statement actually calls for. Uh, as you quite rightly uh, point out, there are several issues involved here. The, the, the way that uh, Greece has been stopping uh, migrants from coming into, the, uh, uh, into their country and sending them back, leaving them in the middle of the sea sometimes. Uh, but also there's the point of origin, uh, dealing with the point of origin. Uh, this, I think, is, is why the uh, discussion has come up right now, the, uh, the issue of the, the potential of hordes of Af Afghans coming 
um, out there wanting to leave the country and potentially coming through Turkey and wanting to get into Europe uh, through Greece. So is the issue um, perhaps about how to help people stay in Afghanistan, help the refugees before they have to leave the country? Is that what needs to be dealt with first and foremost? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and you know, with Afghans, uh, just because of the uh, how things are uh, happening in Afghanistan right now, this may be rather a, a hard job to, to accomplish. But on the other hand, we have a bigger problem that's been going on for the last 10 years. Uh, we don't have the same kind of uh, problems uh, facing the Syrian refugees. Um, Turkey has been the only country that has been trying to build of some kind of a uh, a livable space in northern Syria, uh, building schools, building hospitals, um, trying to, to return people to their normal way of life and spending money. If if EU <clears throat> did at least as much as Turkey did in northern mm -hmm. Syria, we shouldn't have the problem uh, of having to house this many refugees from Syria in Turkey. Uh, hence, <clears throat> not you know, also affect the EU its, itself, uh, you know, towards the more western part of the Europe. Uh, Europe. Um, but you know, the Afghan situation is now a very fresh situation. It is uh, quite uh, ambiguous right now as to how things are going to play out in Afghanistan. But yes, the same thing uh, will also need to be done there. But seeing what hasn't been done by the EU uh, in, in Syria, uh, unfortunately, does not give us much hope as to what they could actually or would actually be willing to do for Afghan, uh, Afghan Afghanis and Afghan refugees in the coming up uh, months and, and years. In fact, you quite rightly point out the the, uh, the, the excellent example that Turkey has set in northern Syria, um, creating livable space and opportunity uh, for for migrants to return there. Uh, the, uh, this underpins, I guess, what, what uh, Turkish Foreign Minister Mevlut Cavusoglu was saying earlier today. Uh, there was the United Nations um, uh, um, conference to discuss uh, supporting uh, the, the humanitarian aid in, in Afghanistan. And he said it's a moral duty of the international community to support Afghanis with humanitarian aid. This really is the message that Turkey is giving to the world, isn't it? And what hopefully Greece and Europe will finally twig is the way forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we have a, um, a, a religious uh, motto that actually has uh, pretty much burnt into our culture, where we say um, it, the, those who let their neighbours go to sleep on an empty stomach uh, is is not from from our community. Now, having said that, the world has to realize uh, it does not really matter anymore how many thousands of kilometers is uh, Afghanistan is from Germany. We are all we all have some moral duties to make sure that in this day and age, in this uh, industrialized and modernized world, uh, we should definitely uh, have. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't even do that, but uh, put a stop to hunger around the world. And at this point, we should have also established that all children uh, are able to get at least some, uh, you know, preschooling and, and, uh, and, and primary schooling in everywhere in the world, and adequate health care, and uh, an opportunity for people to work and make their living. Um, but unfortunately, as I said, especially the, the Western nations of the world has long, uh, you know, forgotten about this, has not really cared, thinking that the distance, the physical distance between them should be enough of a barrier uh, between, the, between the two geographies, uh, in, in this case as Afghanistan. But as I said, in this day and age with uh, communication, with transportation being this easy, uh, this uh, inexpensive and this convenient, uh, the world is really becoming one big village where no one nation, no matter how far away from another nation is, 
can actually afford uh, to just overlook what's going on in, in the rest of the world. And I think that is the, the fundamental problem that we are facing right now. Turkey has been acting accordingly uh, as to help, trying to help uh, you know, all the nations. As you know, uh, we are the, the, the leading country in the world helping others uh, compared to per capita. Mm -hmm. And only if these, uh, you know, uh, countries, developed countries of the West would do something even close to what Turkey is, is, has been doing, uh, we could have resolved most of this problem much, much easier. And in fact, these, uh, these nations should look at themselves in shame when they see what, what Turkey has, has achieved with its resources. Um, and it's not just uh, in Turkish uh, culture or in Islam that one should help uh, your neighbours in Christianity and in European culture as well. Uh, they have a moral duty, a religious duty to do exactly the same. Um, uh, let's hope that uh, the lessons are learned and the example of Turkey is followed. Ono moment. thank you so much for joining us here today on The Edge. Pleasure speaking with you. Turkey has always emphasised the need to pursue projects that create employment and provide returnees access to quality education and healthcare, as it's done in Syria's northwestern Idlib region. We hope the plight of all refugees would end in the near future through international cooperation. Uh, analysts have provided their insights on today's top stories. Let's have a roundup of what they had to say. Before closing our programme, let's take a look at social media to hear your voices and reactions on today's top story, shared with the hashtag Refugees. And let's see what you've been having to say on Twitter about refugees. Alice Weitzer says thousands of Afghan refugees are now in northern Virginia awaiting processing. Many could relocate permanently to the D.C. region. But how can refugees afford life in one of the country's most expensive housing markets? Mirza Amir Baig says very characterless approach by those who are responsible for this human crisis in Afghanistan. The US, the UK, the EU, Canada and Australia must accept Afghan refugees with an offer of unconditional citizenship. Amasud Mohseni says, We stand in solidarity with the people of Afghanistan. The growing humanitarian crisis is concerning and we believe that all civilians and refugees must be treated with compassion, dignity and respect. And let's now take a look at our video of the day, which shows some ways you can help refugees around you.
And that's all for this episode of The Edge with me, Andy Boynes. Stay tuned. We'll be back tomorrow with more in-depth analysis on the top stories and a look beyond the edge. Thank you.